Hello, I'm Jane Wald. I'm executive director of the Emily Dickinson Museum, and I want to welcome you to this first poetry reading of our 2023 Phosphorescence Contemporary Poetry Series. Emily Dickinson's lexicon, which for years she once said was her constant companion, defined phosphorescence as a faint light or luminescence of a body unaccompanied with sensible heat. To Dickinson, phosphorescence was a, a shimmering mystery, a transformative essence that in her own language elevated plain print to italics, facts to real learning, and prose to poetry. We launched this phosphorescence series during the pandemic in 2021 in celebration of the power of poetry to spark the imagination and ignite transformation. We're thrilled to return with another series running uh, monthly between May and October this year. Established and emerging poets from all over the world. During this evening's program, we encourage you to use the chat feature in your Zoom app to share words of encouragement with our wonderful poets tonight. Uh, and we'll be sure to share your comments with them after the program. Tonight's readings will be followed by a Q&A with our poets, and we'll take questions from our audience using the typed Q&A feature, uh, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Feel free to place questions there at any time uh, during tonight's program, and we'll, we'll get to them as they come. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's poets who are joining me here in Emily Dickinson's uh, Amherst Homestead in her recently restored parlor. Dara Barwad Dixon uh, was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and lives and works in Western Massachusetts. Her books include the recently published Tol Tolstoy Killed Anna Karenina, In the Still of the Night, You Good Thing, Reverse Rapture, and Chat Books Through Nine and Two Poems. She edits uh, for Factory Hollow Press and has received support for her writing from Lannan, Guggenheim, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. She's offered poetry writing uh, and form and theory seminars for Hollins University, University of Alabama, University of Montana, University of Texas, Emory University, and University of Massachusetts Amherst as well as at other art organizations and locations across the United States. Gillian Connolly is a poet, editor, and translator. Her new collection, Notes from the Passenger, is just out with Night, night Boat Books. The author of 10 collections of poetry, Connolly received the Shelley Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America and was awarded the Jerome J. Shestak Poetry Prize a National Endowment for the Arts Grant, and a Fund for Poetry Award. A Little More Red Sun on the Human, also with Night Boat, won the 39th Annual Northern California Book Award in uh, 2020. Connolly is the founder and editor of Volt Magazine and has taught at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, the University of Denver, Vermont College, and Tulane University. A longtime resident of the San Francisco Bay Area, Connolly is currently professor of English and poetry, uh, poet in residence at Sonoma State University. Eleni Sicilianos is a poet, writer, and a master of mixing genres. Your Kingdom, out this year, is her 10th book of poetry, alongside two memoir verse image novels. Sicilianos' writing is frequently saturated with delight in the natural world as a layperson's study of biology and is dedicated to an eco-poetic turning of the kaleidoscope for more angles on what being alive looks and feels like. Edge play manifests in her work in many ways, including in her collaborations with musicians, filmmakers, and visual artists. I'm delighted to welcome Dara, Gillian, and Eleni this evening, and um, we'll invite Dara to read first. Thank you. Okay. So thank you all for having us to this magnificent place. 
And um, thank you all who are watching us and uh, hello to everybody tonight. I'm gonna read a little bit from a chapbook. I'm a big fan of chapbooks because they're small and have very few poems in them and make people seem uh, friendly toward them lots of times. And then I'm going to read a couple of poems from my newest book, Tolstoy Killed Anna Karenina. So I'll start with, um, human behavior involves complicated adjustments. He hates her. She resents this, but doesn't know what to do to be less hated, to be more liked. He is seething, furious. She is smiling, goofily looking as if she is amused by the standoff. They will have a terrible trip to Miami. <laughs> I was not there. In the flesh, to see with my own eyes, to hear with my own ears, to feel with my own skin, to taste with my own tongue, why would I pretend I was? Maybe a wind might, maybe light, maybe better to say so. I was not there. I was adding myself into where I never was. What did I think I could do? Here is where I am. What I'm doing here is calling out to you. Lots of times um, people ask you what, poetry is to you and it's many many things to me and for one thing probably everything that made my life possible and um but this is a little bitty poem that says a little bit about what poetry does poetry makes the bad things we say better it makes the unforgivable things we do come close to seeming forgivable the worst understandable, the least worthy somehow elevated. And that may be what poetry does. It may be why it even is. It takes what's awful and says it's tragic. It makes lies less lethal. It blows oxygen on flames. It holds onto names better left forgotten. It pretends crime is a paradox it takes what kills and says it lives. There is no stopping what poetry does. And this is the smell of stale milk chocolate coming out of its cellophane wrapper. It is as sharp as a dull dagger, as full of broken promises as it comes with a dull shine as frank as anything and as sentimental and sad and terrible, therefore beautiful in the way something can be beautiful because it has to be. And this poem is called Telepathic Kinesis. Telepathic kinesis. The beautiful orphans found themselves wandering in forest of terrestrial magnification. An enormous oversized elk, an elk of epic proportion, a giant of an elk followed their every footstep. They could hear the cracking of underbrush as they hit the dry wood and leaves. They could hear his breath. They heard the thunk of his antlers against the tree trunk as they climbed into an open window of a shack they found, wide-eyed in a green, peaceful clearing, near a sweet little running river's edge. The elk stepped up on the, to the shack's little porch where it didn't really fit. Night fell, the moon rose, an owl flew over the water. 
And this is a few of the crimes you've committed against my heart. Arson, most of all arson. Tongues of flame, flare, lick, and like. I like fire and I like water and a good flaring. Larceny, a little bit of larceny, peppered with a few petty kickbacks, like in self-serve brain surgery. You committed fog against me. You committed horses against me. You attacked me with hummingbirds. You ambushed me with iridescence. You scalped me with trees. You blindsided me with stars. You pushed me over the edge with bumblebees. You broke into me with gills, me with lungs under my wings, with books you electrocuted me, with words you tore me to pieces, with wildfire you blinded me, with inferotemporal neurons you swindled me, you strangled me with satellites, with time and distance you slayed me, you pepper sprayed me with music, you oversalted me with blizzards, you committed rain against me. You committed sharks against me. With rivers and meadows and mountains, you lied to me. With canyons and fog-shrouded peaks, you hid ravens there to kidnap me. You burned me with songbirds and nightfall and morning. You scalded me with flocks. You stole my tongue with tides. With all of this, you set me down. And this poem is called Simile for Its Own Sake. Like a ghost ship in space, something see-through, how the moon used to be, something impalpable, untouchable, or when you go to touch it, your hand goes through it, something haunted, like a lake, like a half a head of hair. It looks idyllic and holds deep, dark secrets, like bent and broken toes, like the last few turns of a spinning wheel, like a sponge dripping blood, like a tired horse, like a broken pillow, like steel-toed shoes, like a long, sharp, winding strand of strange hair, like a two-toned baby rattle or rattlesnake, like Coca-Cola, like where you were born, like where you come from, like from where you get your looks, like from who you are, like chills, like chills curving over your skull, like as if your skull is a horizon, the light on a wall you're trapped behind, like gravy, like the last sliver of light seen through bars on a door, like the smell of a just sharpened pencil, like when you first set foot through the door, like where you hope to go next, like a thought branching into other thoughts, like a thought one can't stop, like a thought you want nothing to do with, like that thought finally put to rest, like putting a thought in its place, like taking a thought away from other thoughts, like not letting one kind of thought overwhelm all others, like being swamped, like water, like water in the rain, like the rain on your face, like tears and rain mixed up on your face, like your face all wet, seeing it in a mirror, like why this is happening, like what can be done about it, like who's there to see it, like eyes left out in the rain, like all the quiet pathways in the next silence of your brain, in your brain's way of being, like a trance you fell into long ago, like keeping your own head down, like being in your head, not mine. Like who you were willing to let in there. And this is my last poem. Thank you all so much. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing Gillian and Alani in a minute. This last poem is called Capitalism. It makes me feel about as low as ASAP makes me feel. <laughs> as if someone is warning me a snake's in my path, only it's a pretty snake. I'm in need of to make my life whole. There's so many kinds of us coming in various versions of ourselves and one another. There is 
since a type whose bold sense of entitlement is bolstered by an unquestioned innate sense of righteousness, something calling for constant comparison, something useful other times, blindingly obliterating to beauty, grace, love, empathy, sympathy, insight, courage, insight, courage, humor, love, grace, humor, wit, foresight, generosity, love, humor, truth, empathy, grace, sympathy, empathy, sincerity, grace, truth, beauty, with courage, adventuresomeness, surprise, love, humor, empathy, kindness, withholding judgment, love, humor, empathy, recklessness, generosity, love, humor, despair, understanding, love, humor, empathy, recklessness, love, humor, despair, loving kindness, love, humor, empathy, humor, joy, sympathy, love, kindness, courage. Thank you very much. That was really beautiful, Dara. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that, I'm, every molecule in my body is buzzing with joy at being here. Uh, thank you so much, Brooke and Jane and Anna and Patrick and the Emily Dickinson Museum and Dara and Eleni. Um, it's great to be here. I'm going to read um, from my new book, Notes from the Passenger, which just came out with Nightbot Books. Um, and I'll start with a poem called The Passenger. The book is essentially a, a kind of bardic journey between uh, the living and the dead. Um, and it jumps in time between uh, the present and the and ancient times and into the future. Um, so I'll just start with the passenger. Once and for all mind wanderings of the passenger, the beer garden's composure in its death rattle, green partitions, scaled walls, backstroking waterways, lure to lure. The passenger rejects projection, its limpid, mirror-like distortion, prefers vibratory qualities of the seat cushion, a spreading of the hands. The passenger walked without destination for years without aging in open sorrow, a suitcase out of which everything had fallen by the wayside, bit by bit, as though a salesperson without wear. Along sidewalks, discarded nurse caps, the gloves of queens, a demolition of the root in the deep micro network between white bark pine and subalpine conifers, the passenger began to step and swerve in an unsteady manner. A hologram projected up against a hieroglyph, figure drawings and caves, indeterminate, exact, the sun going red, yellow, red, often never unearthed. The passenger finished off the memory drink with its supernova's hyper-relativistic speck. Sun still more than four billion years old, a glimpse, a glint into Homeric times when one could pick up one's chariot with one hand. Warmed ocean, open country. It was most like night, this thing we walked into. The messenger. The messenger came without papers and song, out of sleep unharmed, a guide figure at a pit stop, digestive issues, a tingling sore throat. At all times, the time between technologies dripped 
orange silver tinged translucent into dye, pink blue shade of one unidentified flower bush. The messenger took a sprig, couldn't say, I am a messenger with a pistolary anthropological epigenetic trauma. Some deep ancestral thing floats over the greening hills. Surely you understand this, the messenger said at a loss. The messenger had no distinguishing physical characteristics, but was more a feeling that all was going to be made clear. Necrotic silence and a shed, a peaceful death inside a bunker, an overheated RV round, holding screen and air. One could still breathe out of a twizzle stick. The messenger was part of the deep urge to sit, stand, lie down in an aura of intimacy awaiting the message. The charge surround data claims we open around 15 times a day awaiting the message. It does not matter what one secretes or imbibes, whether is a serotonin permafrost, a lickable flame, the messenger would sometimes appear stretched out before the monument, overgrown dragonflies iridescent at pairs, flip mortality over the body picking up pairs, the body that is grounded by the planet. I have sent you a moonstone talisman via snail mail, says the messenger, attempting friendliness. Also, pain is everywhere. War never cleanses. In her silk coat pocket, the algorithm fibrillating, the messenger wanted an implant in the hand the size of a grain of rice to get shopping done, the blackout curtains drawn under a sun color of fresh salmon now frozen. Some said a new seasoning of smoke and ash sprinkled over slices of mango would pretend the messenger was of temporary non-citizenship in an exclusive, genderless, paradisical future universe, an orb where we take a car, an invaginated spermicide, down pathways to an old belief system turned glassine on which on either side, we who were awaiting the message in an aura of intimacy peered, looking through, smitten by the mystery of one another, as if that were the message going all Cohen with a worn deck of red cards, a divining rod, whispering technology of a battery clock. I would love to begin to explain the many voices plugged in, wires dangling a desire for windstorm. Starlings sing to hear themselves. It is pleasurable, reply the naturalists. I would love to begin to say something to relieve the onslaught of unleashed voices, but it appears I have fallen down a sky blue tube in the aura of intimacy awaiting the message. Between birth and personhood, death's even song enters everyone you love, pierces gut, and everyone forgets very, very slowly, pairs flushed russet in trees, a quiver over history's ossuary of banality and greed, the roadside tumbles a child's silver bucket, handle still on the pail. Why day lilies? Why thistle? Why shoes? Hats to carry departed's death essence to those of us remaining among the longest living. We lost the baby, though the baby crowned. When we loved, we were crowned. The sorrows returned when our crowns, gems, thorns, ruptured into our skulls. Bombs, bombs, dick pics and bombs, the live takes of how to sweep cages of baby shit back onto ruling class. I would like to message you, but the white powdery appropriation of my throat, cuttlefish, songbird, vapor, in this body is like a body politic on stringy cloud. 
everyone a sage rising on a platform, a rapture massaged into all of the threats, multi-glottal, the collective dream of art. How even in death or in birth, dust mats glint the perineum, a celestial orbit. The messenger presents the body with the very clean blood in the curse, a head full of uroboros for a wig if all hair falls out. In the middle of no more money, in orgasm, we give ourselves over to the briny substance just under the surface of the divine. Somewhere in love remains trust, in the melody, in the die off, in the clear, clear water the messenger is tracking, Daedalus, where the mysteries are contemplated in the true ink and felt future public orphan of the word, sky blue, clear sky blue. And this poem makes mention of Saint Perpetua, who invented the diary in 203 CE in Carthage in a Roman prison just before she was executed. And the poem is for my daughter. And the title is How It Was No Longer Only the Country That Was Divided. It was the order and their words so that when someone said work, we lie down, so that when someone said art, memory was our insufficiency, we caught it in our hands, grievous sharp. After five or so years, the t-shirt pills. Every day, I say, try throwing it away to teach my daughter something <clears throat> new. Your grandfather's war helmet, I say, your grandmother's high pile of cottony tresses, the opal axis of her hairpin, steel mink of her closed eye, something new. Who speaks through your mouth? Throw it away. Do you want it to say Sister Perpetua or Mother Apocalypse on your t-shirt? Tumbling out, a word order reveals a pack of boys who unzip to sire the city seepage. I say, if dust cosmological camouflage cuts us, we reroute to another street. I mean, who knows? The house might not even be here. You, however, are my wonder. Fatal, prenatal, as water down a leg. I was born after a war, came of age in a war, leave war everywhere. Who speaks through your mouth won't be me. Something very large and open and waiting, waiting. I errand to fill my hull. You scroll and want worlds, the many worlds of wanting worlds. The gentle body of light enters the car slow surfing the speed bumps, carrying us along oceanically. Because I am vanishing, I think to show you how, but not just now. Let's not talk just now. Return, return, says the body of light, deciding to not decide which one of us to call into gentle body of light's luscious quandary, settling also into the front seat transmuted, inflamed, our faces, our voices. If as mother, I gave you mortality. If as daughter, you gave me immortality's brief mirror glint. You are reaching into screen to play your music. If this is the end, empty hands of humanity will not tomorrow be enough for you. Mortality upon us with its rosy edge of want. Mortality upon us with a rosy edge of what? So nothing cannot go unsaid. To pass the night in open air, St. Perpetua invented the diary in prison and after requesting water, knew not to ask for any other favor but perseverance of the flesh. 
I'm green and strong as live oak on dry gold grass. I'm blue with externalizing my interior enemies. When they are gone, I aspirate in primeval mist. James Joyce wrote the dead until the last page was snow full. If there is fire, we will pick it up, play with it. Gentle body of light, I am lonesome pine for you. Who speaks, waits under the blind glare of Jane Eyre's mysterious red room. Unlock, and we river came the lyric. You know that, Patois? Gentle body of light, you've got such a cruel ideal. Grievous sharp-nailed coyote steps at seafoam's edge. If we isolate the isotope, may it rain in the echo chamber. Gentle body of light, when we're within you, we're outside you. We swim the plasma. We would shred the threshold, find airport by matchlight. And I will close with a short poem called White Spruce. If all experience is mystical, the white spruce swayed in the window, branch by branch, almost to the doorstep, willow-like near your sun-damaged eyes. And what do dirt's sinuous motions have to do with leaf's actions? I asked the young woman, I asked the grandmother, and the entire family crawling across the floor. And who is the young returnee who would carry his AK-47 past the 7-Eleven, almost to the corner and back, wanting chips, sometimes candy, a contemplative on duty, this wake sleep, this wake sleep see, the planet and its lost parts lay plow to the furrow, dream a little dream with me. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so happy to be here with Darren and Gillian and just so happy to be reading poems together in Emily Dickinson's house. Thank you so much to the Emily Dickinson homestead. Um, and also for me to be right next door to a biologist's home, Lynn Margulis, who has really been um, as influential to me as Emily Dickinson has her many writings and her um, incredible um, foresight and breakthrough um, in, in theorizing symbiogenesis, uh, a, a, um, evolution that is driven also by organisms working together, not just by competition. That's been a huge influence on me and a huge influence on actually the project that uh, became this book, Your Kingdom, that I'm going to read from tonight. So um, really, and in fact, her son, Dorian Sagan, uh, one of the drawings in the book is from Dorian Sagan. So it's just a double, triple, quadruple. <laughs> That is a centuple pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to start um, with a kind of essay poem. I'm um, just going to read part of it because it sort of explains some of the things that are going on in the book. Um, and But I'll say that I had two books ago, I was writing a lot about um, species extinction. Tomorrow is Endangered Species Day. National Endangered, International Endangered Species Day. I think there are about a million species right now in danger of extinction. Um, so I was working on that and I wanted to still think about an eco poetics, but in a joyful way. And that um, possibility was open to me by watching a salamander fall over a log in California and remembering from my zoology course that the first creatures to invent shoulder girdles and hips were amphibians. So every time we move our shoulders, we can think amphibians. So this, a lot of these poems are meditations on 
the many um, inventions, and that's also a, a faculty of the imagination that other animals made that we carry around with us in our bodies every single day. So from this opening essay poem called Nothing in Evolution Makes Sense Except in the Light of Phylogeny. One July, among the California redwoods, I watched a fire-colored salamander lumber over a log, and so my mind was ignited to meditate on shoulder girdles. Amphibians invented them. In the mid-19th century, the German biologist Ernst Haeckel coined the term phylogeny to contain the notion of the organismal lineages we all passed through. You too may have admired the drawings of diatoms, shells, jellyfish, radiolarians, and spiders he sketched to describe life on Earth. Phyla, phili, tribe, stem, branch. Jenny, again, born, birth. Phylogeny, all the plants who grew to be you, all the animals who did. I don't mean because you were the telos causa, the reason or end result, and I don't mean because you ate them. I mean because they invented earth. Eventually, they also invented you. They twisted and turned and licked and hissed and allowed you to exist. Phylogeny, a word I loved, was invented by a man who believed in eugenics a word in turn invented by a man who invented nature versus nurture. You, Ev, good, well, Jenny, again, birth, born. Ecology, phylum, protista are also words first made in Heckel's mounding mouth. Here I am at the bottom of Heckel's world riddle. Every word I utter haunted in conflict with all the animals. Can anything ever be held away from human tongues? Some hunters in ritual sideways the names for bears, Arctus, Ursus, a taboo on naming what is wild. Instead of bear, a hunter said, the brown one, honey eater, good calf, honey pig. As soon as a bear crept out of a word, a word did its work to erase the bear. The animal's names light up in crackling flame. Main and unmain. Now we are rolling around on earth, draping our tongues in Latin things. We always said the bird doesn't care what you call it. That's one way I'm different from a bird. The bird takes flight from its word. And I'm gonna go into um, this long title poem, Your Kingdom. I'm not gonna read, it's a 55 page poem. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't be reading the whole thing tonight. <laughs> I'm just going to read the first couple of pages. If you like, let the body feel all its own evolution inside, opening flagella and feathers and fingers door by door, a ragged neuron dangling like a participle to hear a bare sound. On the path, find a red eye hole rabbit Fat of the bulbous stock pecked out to the core. A raptor did that. So you can bore back to the salamander you once were, straggling under the skin. Grope toward the protozoa, snagging on the rise toward placental knowing. Who developed eyes for you agape in open waters? The worm that made a kidney-like chamber burrows in, directing your heart leftward in nodal cascade, slow at your hagfish spine. Who will bury your bones, investigate a redwood rain, or tap the garnet of your heartwood bark? 
Put your flat needles on dry ice to inquire after your tree family, father or mother in the fairy ring next to you, find you are most closely related to grass, if you are a redwood. Your hexaploid breathing pores gently closing at night. When did you begin your coexistence with flowering plants from which arose the bee before the African honey badger, but after the dark protoplanetary disk of dust grains surrounding the sun become the earth? You had no nouns, did you? I'm gonna stop that excerpt there. Um, to changing us a little bit of plan, it made me think about phosphorescence um, and um, this section of the where I'm thinking about bioluminescence, not the same thing, but still um, sparks the imagination in a similar way. And Gillian had all that beautiful, um, what was the line, the bodily light? How did how did that go? Gillian? Gentle body of light. Gentle body of light. And I was thinking about this connection. Um, and so I'm going to read this um, poem. It's a little bit longer. It's about four and a half minutes called Animal Light. And it's um, yeah, an exploration of different kinds of bioluminescence, which is just such an incredible thing <laughs> that animals are able to create, not just animals, actually wood, uh, fungi and so forth. And we actually do have our own bioluminescence that we give off. Apparently it's pretty weak. <laughs> um, stronger in the afternoon. Animal light. Some damp wood will give off a glow. Oh, marine vertebrates and those who go spine free. Oh, fungi, oh, firefly, come. Light up the caverns and taverns, encounter illum illumination camo. Bacterogenic light, your autogenic self-made light, flashing libidinally, luciferin, luciferase. Easy now, come down off that high sky. If you see by the light of dead fish and flesh, what will you read in the long night? I will read words to bring my head back to my heart. Noctiluca, my night light. And if the luminous property were your brain, a most brilliant amethyst about the size of a pinhead, could you win a small world, not smash it? I once swam in the milky whiteness of that water, crystal train spreading with each body push, nighttime, Peloponnese, 1985. I was camping on the beach with 12 transient poles, had a crush on a Catholic boy among them. I should say poles as in Polish people. <laughs> I was camping on the beach with 12 transient poles, had a crush on a Catholic boy among them, pre-Cold War border softenings. The sea was our bathtub and showering place. I'd stumbled there in full night, water alive with light. And ever since that liquid phosphorus twinned in the dark upper limits, I've hoped for more glow. I recall other episodes. One, a red spreading visible hum around my bare foot in the sand, hometown, nighttime, and two, a rainbowy array around some of the most awake eyes I've ever seen underwater encounter with a cuttlefish, Caribbean. To throw your glowing arm off and watch it twitch on the seafloor so your eater won't eat all of you. Oh yes, I could dangle a lighted lure in front of my mouth and you'd swim in, never knowing both mouth and barbel are me. A larval glowworm spins silken snares hanging in halos of light in a cave's dark embrace. Some human's life dream is to capture a giant squid whose eye, the size of your head, is made to witness, is made to witness the puniest prey luminous in the fathomage 
word that absorbs its own light. Imagine a red tide night when the waters go glowy, seeing a giant squid move in Luciferae's wakes. We don't make our own bodily light, but Lucifer we invented, the ugliest animal on earth. How can all that beauty we see see back at us? Ah, but a snake and a tick can sense your infrared you're infrared and you do glow at weak levels. Your face bathed in free radical lip lipids fluorescing rhythmically, most brightly afternoon. And let's see, I'm gonna read one more from the book and then one short poem. Close. Um, and this is really directly inspired by Lynn Marcus. She was the first person who made me think about the fact that all of our digestive enzymes, for example, um, are memories of the first chemical reactions on Earth. So we're carrying this deep history in us at all times. If I can find it. I'll read it. Okay, and it's called To Do. It's a to-do list poem. Write cephalopod poem. I write something down for my future self. I want it to change what my self does later. I want it to make my future self know the past thought. Rude time has a role in this. It's been me now and me then all along in a feedback loop. Weird, the then can occupy a past or a future. I was a child then. Then when I'm a hundred, I'll hoot like an owl. Now I'm writing right cephalopod poem. Like a fish that sends itself a signal. This electrical output is from me so it doesn't get confused by another fish's message, mistake itself for someone else. I'll read those marks later and know what to do, write cephalopod poem, or who I am writing. I am signaling to myself to get organized, just like cells tangled up and trying to build a tentacle. Here, I've written it, cephalopod poem. Along with everything else going on inside you, it's a memory of the first chemical kisses, not on Earth, because Earth didn't exist yet when all this kissing started. And then just one short poem, because I wanted to have something that seemed vaguely Emily Dickinson-like, and there was an orchid in here, so. Flowers invite me. Flowers invited me to feel fatter. Flowers invited me to feel plush. Pushy flowers invited me to bleed thick color, but gorgeously. What flowers? Oh, the orchids? No or yes, Amaryllis. Yes or no, my love. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Dara, Lenny. Beautiful readings. I mean, the, your poetry carries beauty, intricacy, power in it. And um, um, it was just so lovely to hear, hear those readings. Um, before we begin questions, uh, I just want to invite our audience to send in any questions that you have through the Q&A tool in Zoom. Uh, we have a couple coming in uh, already, but I, you know, I, I first want to um, ask you, it's, it's no accident that you three are here together. Uh, <laughs> and I wonder if you could share with us and with our audience um, how your paths first crossed and have, may have recrossed over, the, over time. Wow. <laughs> Um, I guess I could start. 
I've known Dara for a very long time, yeah. um, decades, and I, we were just talking in the car on the way over. Um, I met, I saw Dara Reed in New Orleans in 1984, I believe, mm -hmm. and that's when we met. And I, I actually went to graduate school here at UMass Amherst. And um, Dara was just getting ready to start teaching here after I had left. And Eleni, I met when I read at UC Boulder. And then another time was, what, when was it? I don't know. Yeah. But actually, of course, I've known both of them before I ever met them through the poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. We all read each other. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of our first questions um, has to do with um, poetic influences among women. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, in our audience is um, working with the idea of uh, matrilineal mm -hmm. uh, heritage and mm -hmm. uh, passing on of influence and using Emily Dickinson as an example of that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they would like to know, um, you know, how you might have been influenced by Dickinson's poetry, and really what poetic influence means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was influenced first by Emily Dickinson's letters. Mm -hmm. um, I. And I was given the three volumes edition of the letters as a arrival of your gift. Mm -hmm. And so I started reading it and I thought that I had been a very poor reader of her poems previously. Mm -hmm. And so I was awakened to finding her poems again, but also the speaker and the person who wrote those letters was somebody I adored. Mm -hmm. And her spirit and her original mind was without fail through her generosity and her flirting in the letters, her insistence in the letters, her wanting to be like wanting to connect to the person she was writing to. And with a kind of great, I think, joyous playfulness so much of the time. And I loved it. And so then I got to read her poems freshly knowing her better. I had read biographies of her and stuff like that, but they were not the person who wrote the letters. Mm -hmm. And so the letters were really, really important to me. Then you all here at the homestead uh, had a thing where you read, let people read all of her poems. Mm -hmm. And one year, a lot, pretty long time ago now, I read the section of her poems that were just out of this world on fire. Mm -hmm. and I it was an accident that I just was in line and that's what I got and I was I had chills just the whole time I was reading them like I had discovered them again mm -hmm. so yeah you know she's she's great yeah. <laughs> I have to confess that I loved her letters first mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. the way they crack mm -hmm. oh yeah they're great mm -hmm. um Eleni yeah I love hearing I mean I think she's I mean, she's just an endlessly on fire and giving poet and and um, also figure. I feel like every time I come to some, it read uh, the the book by the gardener uh, here, yes. and that that was just so interesting to to think about her um, her deep intelligence and communication with the plant world. Um, and also, I love the way that that book in particular makes us rethink the hermit figure and that she was actually having all kinds of communion with, with her niece and nephew and with kids in the neighborhood and baking bread and writing little poems and gifts. Um, but yeah, I guess just she just is an endlessly mysterious, richly mysterious and richly mysterious person. Um, and I think for me, in terms of 
matrilineal lineage. Um, she also comes, Susan Howe was very important for me, mm -hmm. was actually one of my teachers. Um, so that lineage feels very alive. And there's so many poets I admire who are really deeply steeped in her work, Jen Bourbon being another one. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Lynn Margolis was influenced by Dickinson and quotes her a lot. So um, she's she's just a powerhouse. And I, I mean, I think of her and uh, Whitman as the two American progenitors. I share her birthday with Whitman. So oh, yeah. he's, yeah. I have to come yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and do it. Um, the, I I think the most remarkable thing about Dickinson is that the work is so alive today and seems completely new today. And it's the multiplicity of meanings and associations that you get with Dickinson. Um, the thing I love the most about poetry is that it's unparaphrasable, mm -hmm. and she is completely unparaphrasable. Mm -hmm. And in terms of matrilineal heritage, I just want to, I, I mean, I agree completely with everything Darren Eleni just said, especially the Susan House book and Marcia Warner's and Jim Burton's mm -hmm. work. But I also wanted to mention, there's a wonderful story about when Audrey and Rich in the 50s, um, she was she was taught in Emily Dickinson that had end drawings and no dashes. Mm -hmm. And so when the Johnson edition came out and the dashes were mm -hmm. put in, that she wrote about how it completely you know changed her life and blew her the top off of her head, as Dickinson would <laughs> say. And it was a completely as um, you know, this is this is what poetry is. And so it's a really, it's, she's been an, an incredibly influential poet that has been extraordinarily important to women and to men and to, to you know, people of all gender fluidity. And, you know, she's just, she was a genius and reminds so um, globally important. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so sort of different tack on that same question. I'm wondering if your poetic lives or if your your poetry has had influence on each other uh, and how that might how you might talk about that. I see I see you nodding, Gillian. So <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I can think of Ways in both that both Dara and Eleni's work has influenced me. Um, Dara, in terms of what she does, um, a poem that is has the structure of a list, and yet it goes into all of these directions um, that one is not expecting at all. And Eleni, in terms of what she does on the page. Mm -hmm with white space and with landscape. I mean, I think that she and I share a um, a landscape mm -hmm. and on the page mm -hmm. that I, I don't know if I'm being very articulate. Mm -hmm. You're nodding, you know what mm -hmm. I mean. So <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know, you know, when I listen, like when I just listened to both of your new books, I was basically in awe of listening to them mm -hmm. and, and hearing something brand new in the world and with familiar language. And one of the things that struck me too is that you both use a lot of uh, biological and various kinds of scientific words, mm -hmm. you know, and I love that, I love running into those words in a poetic poetry context mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i don't know that i have done a lot of that except in titles and mm -hmm. that's where those words tend to live in my work like up in the titles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think it's interesting because and it makes me question what i'm doing mm -hmm. you know it makes me think about it mm -hmm. and i like that i like mm -hmm. it when people's work gives me something to really think about mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say, I, I don't think I could pinpoint an, 
influence per se, but just a deep enjoyment of both um, Dara and Gillian's work. And I mean, Dara's sly, understated humor that always comes through. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, yeah, this list uh, thing that Gillian was mentioning, which we heard in that last poem so beautifully, mm -hmm. where, and this repetition of very simple words that just takes on this whole other world so fantastic and then yeah Gillian's um also Gillian's use of the page for sure and the gaps between words and lines but also um your your ability to have kind of a sense of uh character even though there are characters per se mm -hmm. it's really stunning mm -hmm. um okay. just going back for a sec I was just I one of the poets, thinking of matrilineal lineages, one of the poets I've been very excited about this past year is uh, an Uruguayan poet, Amanda Berenguer, and she was very influenced by Dickinson. She translated Dickinson. So I just wanted to throw that out cool. for that question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, we have another question um, that's about um, what it's like to write post-pandemic. Um, if, you know, coming through the pandemic, now, uh, whether that's affected or had an impact on perhaps the content or the themes or the form uh, of your work. Mm -hmm. Daryl, would you like to? Um, I, think, I think it's bound to. Yeah. It would be impossible to avoid it. And, you know, the times you live in generates a lot of language. And so think of all the language that's come into our consciousness because of the pandemic, you know? And I think what's one of the things that struck me very early on in the beginning of it was that um, for a long time, artists desire to, and for good reasons, love uncertainty mm -hmm. and, some, and not knowing what is coming. And the pandemic put the brakes on that for a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. They wanted a little bit certainty. Mm -hmm. They wanted a little bit of knowing what's coming. Like, when is this going to be over? It was like a, such a sweet question people asked each other at the very beginning with people hoping it would be like, oh, you know, by spring. Well, well that was, you know, a dream. But um, I think it, it, it also called into very, very sharp distinctiveness uh, our mortality. And you definitely wrote, a, you addressed that so directly over and over again. Mm -hmm. Plus, our becoming who we are mm -hmm. with your interest in the poems, like where our shoulders came from, mm -hmm. or where, and all that was, that's all to me related to a consciousness that becomes more self conscious because of our time mm -hmm. yeah yeah um yeah i don't i feel like often these big events come out more slowly in my work except that i was certainly thinking a lot about viruses and mm -hmm. as also drivers of of because i was uh, uh, they didn't make that didn't make its way into the book but um yeah drivers of evolution actually and this weird um non-life entity that actually I mean, has um this capacity to uh drive life i don't know so mm -hmm. i don't know where it will go yet but it would it may be and i think also just thinking about all these ways that we don't have control over mm -hmm. that's you know we think we have mm -hmm. control but we really mm -hmm. don't yeah. which i think is also for me what is exciting mm -hmm. in poetry is mm -hmm. that like just the proliferation of me we don't have control over meaning actually mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would really agree about the loss of control that comes up uh, strongly in my book that notes from the passenger, the idea that we're, we're passengers, mm -hmm. you know, not drivers, mm -hmm. and that we have a recognition, having, going through this, I mean, we're, it's a historic epic, and uh, and it isn't over, and the that that we do not have control over. You know, poets love uncertainty. I don't like uncertainty in my life, so <laughs> I love it in poetry. <laughs> and, 
you know, yeah, yeah. So people, that, people love it in Emily Dickinson also. Right, fact that we can't yeah. do things we can't know. Yeah, 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 yeah that it's yeah. just an unknowable yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. But when it happens in your life, that's a completely different thing. And mm -hmm. I, it, it's that loss of certainty, that loss of control, is not a bad thing for human beings to experience, as painful as it is. Yeah, yeah. And I'll add just one little thing—not little thing, but something. I think it's really brought out in people a desire to take more seriously how to comfort one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's been in mm -hmm. poetry too, mm -hmm. but, you know, mm -hmm. because you can be comforted by something that's challenging you, just mm -hmm. as you can be mm -hmm. comforted by somebody who's mm -hmm. being sweet to you. Mm -hmm. no. It will engage you. Exactly. Just, you know. You feel like your brain's working. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. So it's been kind of a companion for us, I think, through through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, poetry's mm -hmm. had a lot of a help for people to do it. Mm -hmm. um, we have another interesting question um, for you as poets, and it is when you when you sense a, full, a poem forming in your mind, um, when and how do you decide on structure and form? Uh, for that new poem. I don't really decide. I let the... That's a wonderful answer. Yeah. <laughs> I let the material decide for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You let it emerge and mm -hmm. take shape mm -hmm. and then it's so much sort of you attend, can attend you to it. Form it. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it, it, yeah, and then it just certain. Point. Yeah, but yeah. is that true? Kind of, do, do you do you ever approach a poem or a theme um, with sort of guardrails, like uh, you know, some kind of criteria right. constraint? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. Guardrails is a pretty good word in a way to use about some of it, or like a ban. It's like you have something to hold on to. Yeah. But also, I you know I do use forms. Mm -hmm. Like I might, I wrote a whole book that was nine line, nine stanza, mm -hmm. eighty one line poems mm -hmm. because that made nine. Mm -hmm. And so I, every poem, every day, I started, and I knew I was going to write eighty one lines, mm -hmm. and that was it. And then I wrote two other books that were everybody was uh, everybody <laughs> was a. Uh, um, 14 line poem <laughs> and I was so grateful no mm -hmm. it's so exciting yeah. to to have the slight uh, like real fear of like oh no this poem has to end in like three lines <laughs> <laughs> no I can't just go on forever yeah. you know and there's some real comfort in knowing mm -hmm. that this is where you're going to stop mm -hmm. and it puts pressure on you in ways that are shocking Shockingly helpful sometimes. Mm -hmm. You don't expect it to be, but you want to probably save your neck. And mm -hmm. that is what makes you say things that you had no intention of saying, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and to get out of it mm -hmm. alive, mm -hmm. you know. And so I've done a lot of, so when I do get a new poem, say when I'm writing in a couplet's form or some something that I'm really using and thinking about. I, I, something might strike me to write a poem and I will make use of that form. Mm -hmm. And I like being able to have those decisions made mm -hmm. for me. And I've got a lot of other ones to make. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like we all do, you know, at different times, different ways. And Eleni, if you have a different answer, then we can share that it's kind of open, open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I mean, I think there have definitely been a couple of longer projects where the, the form was dictated by the rhythm of the line, for sure, which in some cases has been a, a rhythm that's come to me in a dream. And so oh, wow. that, that needs to be a long line. I'm thinking of a, a long project called the California poem that starts with very long lines, which um, I don't know if I realized at the time I was writing it, but it was like waves breaking on the shore and it, I knew it needed to be a very long line. So, um, 
I, I'm a pretty restless. And I actually really love working with sometimes it's a, there's no line break, it's a sentence, mm -hmm. and then it goes into line breaks, which can be confusing perhaps for readers, but mm -hmm. I move a lot between form and I use images as well. I do a lot of research depending on the project. You could probably hear that. So that also, you know, trying to shape material mm -hmm. that's not poetic material mm -hmm. is is one of the ways that I always yeah, work with. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But and I was thinking about Emily Dickinson mm -hmm. when Dara was talking, um just or actually just all of us. Um, but the, the way that she has she has such a recognizable form that there's this repetition yeah. of the dashes and you can see. Mm -hmm. And yet then she has those variants. So she's got yeah. this repetition, she's got a set thing she's doing, but she has this this little element where you can shuffle something else in. So I love that. So what's the longest poem she's ever she ever wrote? I think it was one of it was either the first or second poem that we uh, that it still survives. And it was one of her early efforts. Um, I think it was was this the one in the indicator? It was a um, it was one that appeared in an Amherst College publication, hmm. um, and it it was everything was in it? there. I think it's probably I um, this is sort of a guess, but maybe eighty lines long, uh -huh. lines long, very long. long. Yeah. But it was there was sort of references to everything, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. education. I think I've ever read that. Read that, read that astrology and so forth. Yeah, yeah. there was uh, it's 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 quite a read. Mm. Um, it's it's almost like riding a, a galloping <laughs> mm. in some horse. But, mm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's early on in the book. Yeah. Yeah. The galloping Emily Dickinson horse. Yes. <laughs> right there. On the wall. Yeah. So <laughs> we're uh we're almost um at time, but I'm kind of wondering if you all, as long as you're here together in Emily Dickinson's parlor, do you have any questions for each other? How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we heard we heard in or the penultimate question a lot about how you do it and how you do it in different ways. So that I think is just really uh, just intriguing for all of us. Uh, and also because um, you know we 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 see as you as you said, Eleni, how Emily Dickinson does it. Mm -hmm. you know, and she's got her own way. Um, well, this really um, concludes uh, this evening's first phosphorescence poetry reading. And I really want to thank each of you, Dara, Eleni, and Gillian, for being with us tonight uh, and for kicking off this series. It's such a wonderful, beautiful way. Um, we, uh, we look forward to welcoming uh, our audience back uh, for another phosphorescence poetry program in June. Uh, and our poets then will be Ocean Wong, Joseph Fritsch, and Yan Yi. Um, so to register for that and any other programs, uh, or to learn more about the Emily Dickinson Museum, or please to make a donation, visit us at our website at www.emilydickinsonmuseum.org. Thank you. 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 Thank